So my name's Alex. Uh, I'd like to tell you about neural networks at Twitter with Autograd. And this is, so that's the GitHub address of this project. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some context around the project as well. Um, and this is work joint with Luke Alonzo and Clement Farabe at Twitter. And a lot of this was inspired by the work done by Dougal McLaurin, David Duvenot, and Matt Johnson, and Ryan Adams, a uh, machine learning group at Harvard, which created an original version of this project that we ported and kind of industrialized. Um, so as like a brief outline, um, here's just some things I want to touch on. So deep learning software is really rapidly improving. Why is that? I, I think there's some concrete reasons behind that. Um, and I want to tell you about Autograd, which is a project that turns numeric code, so just regular code that looks like NumPy, uh, into trainable machine learning models, right? So this is, this is um, something that uses something called automatic differentiation, and it's a very opinionated implementation of it. And this is kind of the, the yin to probabilistic programming's yang. So it's really a very complementary technique. Uh, so while probabilistic programming might not be appropriate for images of cats and kind of incendiary politics on Twitter, uh, neural networks, you know, are actually pretty good models of cats and incendiary politics on Twitter. Um, and uh, I think Autograd and other deep learning packages like TensorFlow are really at the frontier of building new libraries for deep learning, uh, but we're really not done. And I kind of want to speculate a little bit about where we might be going. So the state of software uh, in deep learning, there's really an explosion of tooling in this deep learning space. And I think that this is because there's very excellent sharing practices in the research community. So as soon as a paper is published, you'll almost always be able to find code implementing that paper, which is pretty outstanding and unique in terms of scientific fields. And the industrial community is also very active and involved as well. And actually, these communities are, the, the lines are blurring. Industrial and academia are, uh, are really overlapping pretty substantially. And these software packages are becoming much faster and more flexible. And the speed, I think, is from uh, the involvement of industry. Um, and I think the flexibility um, is most seen in terms of the diversity of models that you can easily write. You can write very complicated stuff in modern uh, deep learning packages that really were impossible to do five or six years ago, or very, very difficult to do five or six years ago. And all of this lives on top of some abstractions that we really no longer think about, but are worth mentioning because I think the parallels are interesting. So all machine learning lives on top of stable numeric linear algebra abstractions that we haven't thought about for about 20 years. Right? So with Fortran in the late 50s, the idea of an array was birthed from nothing. And now we assume that we have arrays on uh, computers. And then you know, later on down the line, uh, we figured out the right abstractions for expressing linear algebra on the computer with BLAST and LIMPAC and LOPAC. And we don't really think about those things very often anymore. And I think that's good. Uh, and then further on down the line, uh, the space of common subroutines we didn't really have to think about um, was uh, increased with environments like MATLAB and NumPy. So these are all things that we should take for granted to stay sane. And the effect of these abstractions getting better and better and better is that over about a 60 year period, numerical computation went from something that was only available to experts to something that was available to trained and interested professionals, journeymen. Uh, they were just trying to do their job in aerospace or in oil exploration. Uh, and now hobbyists can meaningfully participate in anything that involves linear algebra on the computer. And this was a very, very long process. But we're now to the point where if you want to you know, multiply a matrix by a vector, you don't have to spend three months getting that to work. It's almost a silly idea to think about uh, that ever being hard. But it, it was. I think the same is happening in machine learning, and we're seeing this happen at a much earlier stage than uh, the way it is for uh, numerical linear algebra. So I think we're in a third wave of deep learning software, where the first wave for experts only was do it yourself. You might have written it in MATLAB. Uh, you might have written the gradients for your neural network by hand. It's error prone. It's very, very difficult. And I think we're completely past that point now. Uh, and the second wave, uh, where interested professionals could take a model like a convolutional neural network and figure out how to get it to work for their particular task in industry. And I think that's something that's been largely solved uh, with packages like CUDACOMNET and CAFE and Theano. And internally, um, these pack packages use machine learning algorithms like backpropagation to train their models, but the user doesn't see any of that. It means that there's no modularity. So if you want to do something slightly different, good luck, right? I also think we're past this phase. I think we're entering a phase where hobbyists can meaningfully participate in deep learning research. Um, and the level of modularity that's now exposed to people that want to build these types of models is much more fine-grained. So you can actually work with different neural network layers and compose them and actually some more basic linear algebra operations. 
And I think this is happening because as time goes by, abstraction quality is increasing, right? So we don't have to worry about all the fine details of our derivatives and uh, of our linear algebra operations. We don't care about those things anymore. We're just reasoning in terms of the pieces of neural networks. We're kind of fitting Lego blocks together now, which really wasn't the case 10 years ago. Right, so I think now we're transitioning into this phase where it's beyond just interested professionals, but it's something you can do on a weekend. You can have a hobby out of deep learning, or at least in certain aspects. So six years ago, what did this look like to kind of train restricted neural nets that weren't accessible to, to everybody? Uh, so this is one example from CUDA ConfNet, um, where on the left, I'm gonna specify two layers, a fully connected layer with 50 units and a fully connected layer with 10 units. And uh, there's, I think, maybe like seven or eight of these different uh, modules that you could put in a particular order, so you have a very limited set of pieces you could compose. Uh, and their architecture is very rigid, it's linear, right? You have to connect A to B to C to D. Um, and also, something that bugs me a little bit is I don't get to see what's actually going on here when I specify this model. I don't see what is a fully connected layer. I can't see inside of it, I can't reason about it. And most importantly, if something's wrong, I can't figure out what that is to fix it. Right? And also, how the model is trained on data is completely hidden. You just have no access to that. So, and I want to show you what this looks like today with our package called Autograd. Um, and this is in Lua. And we use a numeric library called Torch, which is just equivalent to NumPy, if you're not familiar with it. Um, and uh, all we do is we import Autograd. And then this is the entirety of a two-layer neural network. So if you've never seen the internals of a neural network, this is it. This is a simple one, but you now can go home and write your own neural network. Uh, and so that first function there, predict, is just um, multiplying uh, the inputs by a weight matrix and adding a bias, and you're gonna do that again. And then use uh, the, um, uh, you're gonna spit out probabilities of classes. And then we'll define our loss function, which is a way for us to compare how how good our prediction is relative to an actual ground truth label. And then the last line there is the entirety of the API of Autograd. This is really the only way to interact with this software package. It's a higher order function where you say, I have a function loss, and I would like to get the gradients of um, the loss with respect to the parameters. So give me a new function that instead of spitting out my loss, spits out tensors that are the same size as my parameters, but include the gradients. So that's literally the entire API. But I'm not showing you how it's trained, um, but just a little bit more code to actually train this neural network. Right, so I've just added a couple lines here where I'll iterate over an imaginary data set. I'll uh, actually call this um, gradient function that I've had Autograd compute for me. And then I'll loop over my parameters and just uh, with some small learning rate, update my parameters with my gradients. So this is the entirety of a neural network. And the content of predict and loss can be any differentiable expression. So imagine being able to write down any numeric expression that ends up with a one dimension, with the number at the end being returned. You can train that model with Autograd. So it's, it's a language that lives on top of a numeric library torch, uh, but looks exactly like it, right? So you just write your numeric code and you automatically, that becomes a learnable machine learning model. So what's actually happening behind the scenes? So we have some expressions, say sum of W times X plus B, uh, where we're just multiplying uh, a matrix and vector, adding uh, a vector, and then figuring out how close it is to some other vector y. So what we're doing implicitly behind the scenes is building this computational graph. That's kind of what Autograd is keeping in its head as each of those expressions is evaluated. And uh, what Autograd is, is doing is actually at runtime. So there's zero compile time, which is in pretty stark contrast to other packages like Theano. So this will just run immediately. Um, and uh, so what Theano and TensorFlow actually ask you to do is not, it doesn't discover this computational graph as you run your code. It asks you, it, they, those libraries will ask you to specify the whole thing ahead of time, which can actually be cumbersome in some cases that I'll highlight later. Uh, and then other libraries like Scikit-Learn, you actually don't get to specify your compute graph at all. There's a, a family of models that you can pick from, but you can't compose them in an interesting way. So, this is great for actually evaluating, you know, some particular green square loss at the end, but how are we actually learning anything here? Like, we have to update W and we have to update B in order to say we've learned a neural network. And the way Autograd does that is using something called automatic differentiation. And just like probabilistic programming is uh, probably the abstraction for a large set of machine learning models that deal with probability distributions um, in a particular uh, formulation, Automatic differentiation is the abstraction for gradient-based machine learning. 
It is, goes under many different names like backpropagation or the chain rule of calculus or reverse mode autodiff, but it really is like the essence of how you train gradient-based models in machine learning. The way it works is just like in a numeric library where you, you, know, you define and memorize some functions like multiply and sum and a whole host of those forms your numeric package like NumPy uh, or Torch, uh, with automatic differentiation you augment those functions with some pairs. Right, so if I have some one argument function sum, I'm going to define one extra function is the partial derivative of sum with respect to its arguments. And what that means practically is I have some way of updating the arguments with respect to the output if I so choose to do that. And with multiply, because I have two arguments, you know, A times B, I will have two different partial derivatives that I'll have to define. And I'll just write those down in code and the user will never have to know about them. Uh, and then I'll be able to update both of those arguments of multiply. And then you can compose these things down an entire compute graph by just adding the gradients as you walk up the tree to figure out what the graph is, and you walk back down the tree, which is to figure out how to update the inputs with respect to the output. So that's automatic differentiation in a, in a nutshell. But the way that different libraries implement this and the granularity of these partial derivatives is really what distinguishes them. So kind of in the old days in quotes, um, you might only expose a whole model. Right, so you might only have your level of modularity be a convolutional neural network, a feed-forward neural network, and that's all the pieces you get to play with. Uh, and then the kind of next wave of deep learning software lets you play with entire layers. So you could compose these layers that actually themselves are composed of operations inside of them. Kind of where we are today is that the, the pieces you get to play with are the most fundamental kind of operations you would do with data on a computer. And this is how Autograd and TensorFlow work. And the reason why there's these modularities is which partial derivatives did the developers choose to actually implement and expose to the user? And that's kind of the essence of the difference between a lot of these different libraries. Um, so just as an aside, what automatic differentiation is not, it is not symbolic differentiation. So it's not something like Mathematica where you write down an expression and it derives that expression for you uh, in the same symbolic format. And it's not numeric differentiation where you perturb the inputs of a function and see how that changes the outputs. Right, so it's, it's a different technology uh, and lets you get uh, analytically correct derivatives uh, for your models without having to have a whole bunch of kind of symbolic rules. Um, so with this uh, technology in hand, this automatic differentiation and an implementation of it in a particular language, uh, we really don't want to have any limits on the models that we can write. So we don't want to be constricted to one style. And the reason is sometimes uh, a whole model is actually a good abstraction. Sometimes I want to use just a neural network and be done with it. Or sometimes a layer is a good model because I've spent a lot of time making one layer really fast, like a, like a convolution. And you know, engineers at NVIDIA spend you know, large fractions of a year making that one operation fast. I want to take advantage of that and not rewrite it. But other times, I want to do something weird that nobody's ever written down before. So I want to use add and multiply and sine and cosine to compose something new and actually create a new model. So we should be able to mix these styles. And so with Autograd, you actually can mix these styles in a really natural way. So with the most granular approach, I'm just going to show you a, a multi-layer perceptron of feed-forward neural network in three different styles. And I think you'll be able to interpolate how you can actually mix these uh, with each other. So in this, uh, in the most granular approach, I'm going to define each and every single one of my parameters and initialize them properly at the top. And then when I define my neural network, I'm going to use, you know, add and multiply operations and tan h operations to actually do my computation. So I'm using Torch at its most granular level to actually define what computation I do. And then I'll use some built-in utilities that are kind of shortcuts for Torch uh, operations like log soft max and log multi multinomial loss to actually define my loss on my neural network. So that's the most granular way. But there's a package that came before Autograd called Torch NN, which is the neural network package uh, that uh, it has a lot of use in the community and people have done a lot of work building a ton of different layers We might want to reuse that work and we can do that in Autograd as well. And we've built in um, uh, An API to NN where you can just use any module that was defined by them in Autograd So Autograd in this case kind of acts as a glue for a lot of other people's really great work So you can glue layers together in a much more flexible way if anybody's familiar with the Lua deep learning ecosystem There's another package called NN graph which also serves as glue uh, and Autograd is, is kind of superior in, to it, in, in, it's like a full replacement for it, if that's all that you need. Um, so we'll define all the different uh, uh, nodes that we want to compose, and then in our um, neural network function, 
we'll just call the nonlinearity on the linear layer, do that again and again, and then make a prediction and calculate our loss. And Autograd will work just fine with that as well. And at the most granular level, we've defined about seven or eight different kind of whole models you can just take off the shelf and say, I want a neural network. You just plug it in, and uh, then you have a whole neural network in, in three lines in a function. Um, and so this is, this is kind of a really straightforward usage where you get to pick your level of abstraction based on what's most appropriate for your application at that moment, whether or not you need something very stock, or you want to add something custom, or you want to go fully custom. So you really have the flexibility with that. And at Twitter, we really exploit that in a pretty substantial way. Um, but Autograd goes beyond that, uh, and I want to show you some of the, the kind of cooler features that really don't exist in any other library. So there's extreme flexibility, and this is because uh, of the characteristic that Autograd doesn't build its compute graph until you actually run your code. Right, so in, in packages like Theano and TensorFlow, uh, if you have a loop, you have to have a loop you know, you declare that you have a loop inside of your compute graph. If you have an if statement, you declare you have an if statement in your compute statement. With Autograd, we just use the language's if statements and for loops, right? So it's very natural to express these kinds of these more complicated structures. So um, I'll just run you through this briefly. At the top, we'll just declare our data, which is just, you know, random data we sample. And then there's a variable n loops, which is just some random number from two to four. It's just a scalar, but we'll use that in a second. And then those two lines that are left commented, if you uncomment that, this all automatically runs in the GPU for free. You don't have to think about that. And that's a, that's a really powerful aspect of Autograd that we inherit from Torch, which has a very strong kind of GPU implementation side to it. So GPU support is kind of something we don't ever think about, we just take advantage of it. And then in our function that we'll differentiate through, we, ha we start off with a for loop that uses a variable that we're closing over, right? So closures inside of a function is no problem for us. And that could actually be randomly generated in place. So you could have randomness inside of something you're backpropagating through. Um, and then we'll switch uh, our if statement on the actual, uh, the sum of our weight matrix. So this is a data dependent uh, if statement inside of our kind of, you know, mini neural network that we're using. This is like actually pretty exotic in terms of architectures. It can be very difficult to implement or very awkward to implement uh, in kind of other libraries, non autograd libraries. And then we'll, we'll catalog some data and just store it, uh, and then we'll, we'll sum it at the end. Um, and we can just backpropagate right through that. So whatever you can imagine your neur neural network would look like, Autograd, you can just write it down almost immediately. Um, so to summarize some of the features, you can run on the GPU with one line of uh, code change. We have an optimized mode that I haven't talked about, where we, once we define the compute graph, we'll either cache it for you, or we'll make it more efficient with graph rewrite rules, which is some work in progress. Um, we also do memory reuse, so if in the course of a computation you build some temporary array, we can actually use memory that's kind of uh, been declared um, no longer useful in that computation. So it's actually quite efficient in terms of memory use. Uh, we auto-wrap torch and end, so you get to take advantage of a huge amount of work that's already occurred, and just like insert it directly into your neural network. And this is my favorite aspect of this, is there's no special DSL. You don't have to learn a new language that sits on top of a language. It's just, it's exactly the same as the numeric package before, but silently under the hood, we're actually doing a lot of work for you to make any numeric, uh, numeric uh, any differentiable expression, something you can actually learn and train. Um, and another aspect that's kind of maybe more important to aficionados is we can do second order and higher derivatives. So this is important in certain cases of optimization where before I said you could take the grad of a function, you can actually take grad of a grad of a function, you get the second derivative, and you can do that to infinity, if you want the 80th derivative, you can do that if you so want to. And then something else is we can do array overwriting. So if you have a big array of memory and you want to overwrite a row, ordinarily that's a huge no-no in automatic differentiation. We figured out a really cool way for that just to work transparently. Um, and in practice at Twitter Cortex, this library has meant that if we have a crazy idea, we sit down that afternoon, we write it, and then we train that model, and it almost always just works. Um, and debugging it, debugging gradients just isn't a problem anymore because the gradients are constructed mechanically. So we don't have to worry about these kinds of this nonsense. It's a huge time saver. And not only does it save us time, it makes us more daring in what we're willing to try. Right? And that's actually a really big important change for us is we're willing to uh, entertain much more exotic approaches to problems that sometimes lead to huge benefits. So one example is um, in a very large image classification problem that we have, every image at Twitter that's uploaded we figure out what's in the image, right? So is it a dog, a cat, a stadium, a concert, a person playing guitar alone? Um, we have a huge set of image um, uh, classes that we keep track of, and they're actually not 
one hot classes, they're in a taxonomy. Right, so music might be at the top, and then concert, and then you know, solo, acoustic. So we actually have defined loss functions over a tree, which is something that's very, very difficult to do if you're writing that by hand. But we just wrote that in an afternoon, and it's now in production. And kind of as a corollary to that, it's often fast enough um, during training. So there's a bit of a speed hit that you take, and we're constantly making that better. But it is industrial strength at this point. Uh, but there is zero penalty at test time. You're just writing numeric code. There's nothing special that happens to it when you're not training it. Autograd isn't touching it when you're just running it actually in service. Um, and this is in very, very heavy use of Twitter. I'd say a majority of our deep learning models use Autograd in some form or fashion uh, today. Um, but it's not done. I mean, there's some future directions that I think are really exciting. It's something that I work on uh, personally at Twitter. Um, the main drawback is even in optimized mode, um, it's not as fast as hand-tuned code. And that's not surprising. I mean, speed requirements is like the hammer that breaks abstractions. Great abstraction barriers are just broken by requirements for speed. Um, but I think there is actually a solution. And that solution is to, instead of emitting LLVM code, or sorry, instead of emitting Lua code, which is what our optimized uh, uh, mode does, I think we can write directly to LLVM. And what this means is I think there's a, a really good chance of us writing a domain-specific compiler for machine learning. And the tools already exist to do this. There's a wonderful package called Terra by Zach DeVito at Stanford. And it interoperates with Lua where you can metaprogram a system language that emits LLVM from Lua. It's absolutely amazing. We're beginning some work to actually build a compiler for machine learning that lives inside of Autograd. And I'm really excited about that. Another aspect is if the graph, if your neural network is static, like it doesn't change size across iterations, which is the case for feed forward neural networks, not the case for recursive neural nets, um, you don't need to repeatedly infer this computational graph. So right now we cache that, but I think in this case, um, approaches like TensorFlow and Theano are actually correct, which is just to compile the graph ahead of time. And I think we can actually integrate that into Autograd. If only some parts of the graph vary, like the beginning is static, and then you have a for loop, and then you have something static, why not compile the beginning and the end, and then let the beginning be uh, something that you can infer uh, over time? And this is kind of the equivalent of using a tracing JIT compiler for machine learning, which I think is something that we can do, and we are working on. Uh, and then we can make the error messages better. Um, so for future directions for deep learning software, I really think that in the next three, four, or five years, engineers in the course of solving a problem will write models that today we consider to be absolutely cutting edge and would actually get a publication in, in a cutting edge machine learning conference. But we'll be doing it by accident because the tools will be so good that we just want to solve our problem and learn to predict something from data. Uh, and, the, and the tools will allow us to express it however we want. And I think that we can expect our code to run at peak performance, which is something that we're kind of getting close to there with, with optimized mode and autograd and TensorFlow is, is kind of in, increasing its speed on a, a, like a monthly basis. But I think the automatic differentiation, I think also along with probabilistic programming, will become chapter zero in machine learning textbooks. I mean, Kevin Murphy's book is 1,200 pages. Uh, I think some of those could be cut out if you just never had to take derivatives of anything ever again, uh, which is exactly what automatic differentiation does for you. There's a lot of papers that are published in machine learning where deriving the gradients is a large part of the paper. It's a large part of the work. The answer is just use automatic differentiation. And with good implementations, I think that really is accessible to everybody. Um, so this is work um, kind of in, under Ryan Adams' direction, both at his lab at Harvard and also now at Twitter, and kind of together with Luke Alonzo and Kamal Farabe to industrialize it at Twitter. And so on the upper left is the link to the Torch version uh, that we developed at Twitter, and the bottom right is the Python version uh, that was developed at uh, the Harvard Intelligent Probabilistic Systems Group. Um, that's it. <laughs>